I worked around 30 miles from my hometown, and I rarely returned home during the day unless a work-related issue demanded my attendance. However, Wednesday morning was an exception. Around 10 o'clock, I had completed my job-related responsibilities and decided to stop by my house momentarily, despite the fact that I didn't expect anyone to be there. My children, Lisa and Alma, as well as my wife Monica, were supposed to be in school. She usually spent two hours at the gym every Wednesday morning before starting her part-time work at a fashion store at noon. As a result, I was slightly shocked to discover a silver metallic Volvo V70 in my driveway. Monica had not mentioned any visitors, and it was unusual for her to miss her gym practice. I couldn't help but be intrigued about the V70 because it's a common car here, with no indication of who might own it. Our national car registry enables the identification of a vehicle's owner with a simple text message inquiry. So I texted the car's license plate to the register, and within a few seconds, I had a response with the owner's name and address. The response from the car register piqued my interest because the vehicle belonged to the shop where Monica worked, Paris Fashion Abbey. Elena Alfredson and her husband, Eric Alfredson, were in their mid-forties when they ran the shop. Eric was recognized for his ambition and growing influence. I barely knew them because I was never invited to any of their events. I was curious why one or both of them would be at my place at that time of day. If Alina was the visitor, she must have had a valid reason. If it was Eric, I began to worry that it would be for the worst possible cause, especially given the stories about him. Nonetheless, I am hoping for an innocent explanation for the visit. With caution... I prepared my cell phone's 5-megapixel camera, not intending to use it, but just in case. I quietly entered the house and discovered no one in the kitchen or living area. My pulse raced as I heard faint sounds coming from afar. The door to the master bedroom was closed, but as I listened intently, I heard a woman's voice, most likely Monica's. I opened the door quickly, camera in hand, and stepped inside. Monica and Eric spotted me as I approached the bed, took a photo with my phone camera's modest flash, and was then overcome by emotion. I punched Eric in the face numerous times with my fists. I hauled him to the floor and kicked him hard. Monica shouted in panic, and I yelled at her to be calm. Eric made no attempt to fight back as I hauled him nude from the home and left him beside his car. I then hurled his clothes at him, threatening him to leave my property immediately or face harsher repercussions. He departed swiftly, and I doubt he had the time to dress inside. I instructed Monica to get dressed, leave, and not return until the next day. I also indicated to her that the kids would spend the night with her parents and that I would send them off after school. Before Monica left the house, she tried to persuade me that things weren't as they seemed and that I was her only love. Among other things, I yelled at her again to be quiet. A few seconds later, she complied and left. Looking back, I can only assume that I was in a deep state of shock since recalling the events of the first few hours after the discovery is like being in a cloud. However, I recall calling my employment, notifying them of the situation, and promising to return on Monday. Following that, I called Eric's spouse and informed her that I had discovered her husband naked in my bed with my wife. I can vividly remember her cursing like a seasoned dock worker. As a result, I asked the largest dumpster available to be placed on my lawn. The next step was to move Monica's clothes and personal belongings to the garage. I even removed the few goods she had brought into our home when we first moved in together, including everything she had gotten from her parents and other relatives during our marriage. Everything was stacked on a plastic tarp in the garage. Then I used my electric chainsaw to destroy the pretty expensive bed where Monica had been unfaithful. Following that... I began to destroy all of the other furnishings in the house, with the exception of the children's rooms, where I left everything intact. When the dumpster arrived, I dumped in the remaining contents of the cupboards, then the broken furniture. This was a pricey load. Very true. Monica had a taste for high-quality products. At the time, the financial loss of these goods seemed small in comparison to the emotional cost of my failed marriage. A buddy of mine had a vacation property in the city that his family rarely utilized. I phoned him, explained the circumstances, and rented the property until I found a place to live close to my business. During my lunch break in town, I went to the bank, entered our joint accounts, and split the money evenly. After removing everything but my clothing and personal belongings, I began cleaning the house. 
In the evening, I started working in my still-organized home office by uploading a photo of Monica and Eric to my computer. It was a clear shot of them in various positions, both gazing directly at the camera, removing any doubt about their identity. I was aware of Eric's various goals in local and county politics, including the desire to lead his political party. Politicians frequently seek publicity, and now Eric has received plenty of attention after I emailed the incriminating photo of him with Monica to every local politician whose email I could find, along with a caption outlining their transgression. I also printed and mailed several images to people without email access. Monica contacted me several times during the day. I answered every call, telling her that we didn't have anything to talk about right now. To my amazement, the cops never came, implying that Eric had not reported the assault I committed on him. I spent the night in my son's room and awoke the next morning filled with regret. Understanding the intensity of my overreaction in shock and rage may explain why Vikings were historically feared along Europe's coastlines. Nonetheless, I reasoned that it was better to have overreacted than to have acted recklessly. When a man found his wife had been unfaithful to him while reading the morning newspaper, he came found an intriguing headline, Naked Man in Car Crash. The next report described how a nude man collided with a garbage truck and incurred multiple injuries because he had not fastened his seatbelt. However, the airbags protected him from more serious injuries. One thing was certain. Nobody could blame me for harming his face. Another certainty was that there would be future advances. Indeed, much more will be written in publications about the scandal involving such a renowned leader. Monica got home at 10 a.m. and was surprised to discover the trash can on our yard before entering the practically empty house. She yelled for several minutes before asking me, What have you done? I replied, What did I do? What did you do? You ended our marriage and I cleaned up what was left of it. Your belongings are in the garage. She cried, Remove them before the house sells. Do you understand what happened to Eric? And are you aware that I was dismissed from my job? Do not hold me liable. Is it really my responsibility that you and Eric damaged our marriage and your careers? She didn't respond. Instead, she paced the house, shouting aloud as she grasped the serious consequences of her betrayal. Then she contacted the cops and waited outside until their car came. Two young policewomen asked if they might inspect the house. They asked a few questions regarding Monica's belongings and spent some time in the house and garage before leaving. They expressed their compassion to Monica, stating that my overreaction was really imprudent, but not unlawful. Monica insulted me and left our home. Our children and Monica remained with her parents, and when I contacted them the next day, I scheduled a meeting for discussions because Monica refused to see or communicate with me. We met at a cafe, and realizing we couldn't change the past, decided to talk about the future because I had always admired Monica's parents. I told them the truth and indicated my plans to get an apartment near my business. I wanted the children to stay at their current school and close to their friends, so I offered Monica take custody. My only request was that I visit the kids every other weekend and on special occasions, in addition to shared vacations. Monica's parents recognized the significance of the children keeping a strong relationship with their father and even offered to help Monica purchase me out of the house, as the talks had clearly been more advantageous to Monica than she expected. She agreed to meet with me to discuss the things that needed to be resolved. I met her in the same cafe where I had met her parents, and we both knew there was no turning back, so we avoided addressing it. Instead, we concentrated on making plans for the future. We reached an arrangement on the children, and she said that she and her parents were planning to purchase me out of the house. Using his connections, my boss found a well-located, nice apartment for me to move into a month later. On one of my child-free Fridays, my colleague Anna invited me to supper with her and her husband, Ralph. I accepted, and to my delight, they had brought Ralph's recently split sister, Alice. Alice was pretty lovely and laid back, little younger than me, and we had a good time together that evening. We even planned a shopping trip to the major mall in our county capital the next morning. The outing was a success, and Elise's five-year-old daughter Lena and I quickly became friends. Later that day, Alice and I decided to cook dinner together at her home. The three of us had a great time cooking and eating— Lena stared at me and asked, Do you want to marry my mother? I was caught off guard and couldn't say no, so I said I'd love to. 
but your mother has to think about it first. Lena went to her mother and questioned, Are you considering it? Elise gave us both a lovely smile and said yes, I vow to give it plenty of thinking. Later that evening, when Lena had retired to bed, Elise and I shared some soft affection on the couch, and she added that Lena really wanted her to remarry because her father had already moved in with his new girlfriend, and in Lena's opinion, I was suitable to be her husband. I kissed Elise and told her I would do everything in my power to keep my promise to Lena. I was pleasantly delighted when she recommended I stay the night, providing I behaved properly. Although I wasn't sure what Alice expected in a gentleman, I agreed to be one. I decided to go gently until she instructed me to halt. I gently kissed her, placed my hand beneath her dress hem, and whispered into her ear, It feels like we've been together forever, and I've been in love with you the whole time. She laughed and questioned, Are you joking? She made no move to stop me as I slid my hand up beneath her skirts, touched her thighs, and said, No, I'm sincere, completely sincere. She looked me in the eyes and challenged me, either seriously or in an attempt to lure me. How can I be certain? Trust me, I said. She continued to look into my eyes, saying, I trust you and have feelings for you as well. But doesn't it seem strange to express these things on our first date? I embraced her and stated that I don't know how it occurred so quickly, but it did. And the truth is, I am in love with you. She didn't object as I started undressing her, but she made it clear that unprotected closeness was out of the question. She wasn't on birth control, and she didn't expect me to arrive at our first date armed with protection. Once we were both undressed, I took her to the bedroom where we had a tremendously passionate session. After that, she said that her ex had never made her feel the way I did. Elise and I continued our tender caressing and talk for a time before falling asleep. Concerned that she may be perceived as unworthy of respect and that I might abandon her, I had to reassure her that my declarations of love were sincere. The next day, I took Elise and Lena out to supper at a well-known inn, and we felt like a real family. Returning to work on Monday, I had numerous inquiries about the weekend, and it was evident from my mood that I had a wonderful time. Indeed, Anna's meal was a planned action intended to cheer up a despondent individual, and it well beyond everyone's expectations. Eric Alfredson was abandoned by his spouse and political associates after a controversy, causing him to leave the city. Monica purchased our home after the divorce, found a new job in an office, and is now dating a few men she met online. While I haven't met him, my children have expressed their admiration for him on social media because Lisa and Alma get along well with Elise and Lena. Elise and I are in the midst of wedding planning, and she is even considering starting a family. Our relationship is growing, and we are looking for a home in a beautiful neighborhood. Most people's lives have ups and downs, but things are currently going quite well for Elise, our children, our partners, and myself. Regarding the second narrative, it was undeniably a sad day, particularly a bad Friday for me. Within moments, I would know whether my life had temporarily spiraled out of control. All I could do was wait and see if the predicted tragedy would actually occur. But I wasn't just any depressed soul mourning my destiny. I remembered a valuable lesson from my old sergeant long ago. Action is the best form of defense. My only alternative was to fight, hoping to save my dignity, even if everything else shattered. Fortunately, I had gotten critical information the day before, giving me plenty of time to plan for what was to follow. This is why I found myself sitting in a friend's black Peugeot 307, strategically placed in a secluded spot in the motel parking lot, waiting for my wife to arrive, post-lunch. The moment was filled with tense anticipation as she waited for her red Toyota Yaris to pull in. She arrived quickly, followed by her buddy in his large BMW, who stopped next to my wife's vehicle, exchanged a few words, and then drove to the registration office. Seizing the opportunity, I approached my wife's Toyota, opened the unlocked passenger side door, and took a seat. My astounded wife cried, Billy, what on earth are you doing here? I handed her a brown envelope and said, Not much. I just delivered divorce papers to my unfaithful and soon-to-be ex-wife. Enjoy your time with your cherished real man. And by all means, stay as long as you like, she protested loudly, saying, No, no, no. You have it all wrong. This is not as it looks. Let me explain my existence here. I can promise you that it is not for the reasons you suspect. 
I'm requesting a divorce, and it makes no difference to me if you were intimate with the coward who just raced out to grab your love nest keys. Feel free to be as disloyal and deceitful as you like. As already said, I am indifferent. My once affectionate wife clearly had imagined a more romantic scenario for the afternoon with her obviously eager lover as she burst out crying. At that point, her so-called genuine man returned, flashing the room key and noticing Rebecca in tears still sitting in her car. He opened her door to ask, Who is this person and what has he done to you? As he spoke, I exited the van, took a tiny plastic container from my pocket, and dashed towards him. I heard her cry out, He is my spouse, and he intends to divorce both of us over this. The paramour shouted, I'll take away that foolish thought from the wretched fool. When the paramour turned to face me, I focused on his face, pressed the container filled with a mixture of water and shampoo, and the jet of water shot at his face and eyes blinded him, forcing him to howl in rage while temporarily paralyzed. It was time for my alternate weapon, a dart with three prongs fused to the tip. I quickly stepped behind him, swung my right arm hard, and pushed the dart deep into his left cheek, through his trousers and undergarments. Due to the barbed point, it remained entrenched and could not be removed without medical assistance. My efforts were successful, so I left, leaving the now decidedly unfortunate lovers behind me, shampoo in his eyes, a dart in his behind, and cursing like a seasoned dock worker. My unfaithful spouse remained in the car, crying aloud. I hurried return to my truck and drove out of the motel parking lot without incident, whatever might happen later that Friday. One thing was certain, those couples would not engage in any romantic actions. I am Billy Benson, a 37-year-old Scandinavian man who is now married to Rebecca, who is 36. Our two children are Emile, 9, and Estelle, 7. Rebecca and I have been together for 11 years, married for 10. We own almost everything. A couple in our situation could yearn for this. Thus, we should be really satisfied. But I must convey our dissatisfaction. Rebecca's mother is, in my opinion, the root reason of our sadness. Despite the fact that she is not green, does not have a tail, and does not breathe fire, she should be considered a truly antagonistic dragon who has used every chance to cause me grief. This began the very first time we met. I was invited to supper at Rebecca's house, but it felt more like an interrogation than a pleasant meal. After several inquiries, the dragon stated that she disliked my name because Billy is a diminutive name, and she disapproved of people with such names, stating that aristocratic families never name their children in such a manner, including names like Billy, Kenny, Ronnie, Molly, Nellie, Cindy. Thank you for that. I was surprised when Rebecca and her obviously timid father remained mute as the dragon belittled me. She then noted that Spencer sounded like a common laborer's surname from the days when a son received his father's first name, followed by son as his surname. She went on to say that she expected Rebecca to make a better choice, considering that her other daughter Natalie was set to marry a man of noble blood. I stepped up and questioned Natalie's fiancé's family's nobility, as well as his lack of employment, hinting that he was a leech on the welfare of society, without awaiting a response. I recommended to Rebecca that we get some air. To my surprise, Rebecca followed me, and we exited what I assumed was a dragon's lair. I knew Natalie's fiancé, Alexander, from school, and I wasn't shocked by his ability to persuade Rebecca's mother to consider him as a reward for Natalie. That was not my issue. What mattered was the growing closeness between Rebecca and myself, which, despite becoming extremely strong, resulted in an unforeseen pregnancy that nearly incited Rebecca's mother to open hostility. When she called and raged at me about the type of monster I was, her and other respectable people's opinions, and how any kind of wedding at her expense would be unimaginable. The Los Cristianos Scandinavian Church on the Spanish Canary Island of Tenerife is a popular location for modest weddings. As a result, Rebecca and I traveled there with our closest buddy to get married. Rebecca and I both found fantastic employment in a city 210 centimeters apart from where we grew up, so I had little interactions with her mother, who focused all of her efforts and money on Natalie and Alexander. Rebecca and I, as well as our two children, had a prosperous few years. We made a good living, bought a nice house, and made many acquaintances in our new city. 
our sexual life remained good, and because to the gap I had little interactions with Rebecca's family, as her parents never visited us. When we returned to our original city, Rebecca visited her family and I met mine. Alexander eventually had enough of the controlling woman we knew as our mother-in-law. Surprisingly, he had prospered in his work and happily accepted a promotion that required transferring to a new location 280 SQM away. After some discussion with Natalie, he presented her with a simple ultimatum, accept the separation or seek a divorce. She decided to accompany him to his new position. Now the dominant woman remembered she had a daughter named Rebecca and began making daily phone calls. Rebecca became increasingly distant from me as a result of these calls. The conversation centered on analyzing what I did, hadn't done, or should have done, as well as how well Natalie and Alexander were doing now. Our relationship did not improve when I told Rebecca that Alexander's relocation was mostly motivated by a desire to escape the overbearing dragon, his mother-in-law. Misfortunes tend to cluster, and Rebecca's feelings for me cooled even more when a new co-worker, also from a distant noble family, started at her office shortly after. Rebecca began to laud him as if he were a superhero or at least a true gentleman. He was married to a nurse who was volunteering at a medical aid facility in Tanzania, Africa, with around three months left on her term. The true gentleman and his wife intend to buy a house when she returns, but in the meanwhile, he was staying in our city, renting a room at his wife's sister's house. Who was married? Rebecca irritated me when she compared my actions, tone, and even my wardrobe to the actual gentleman at her workplace. It's unnecessary to mention who was rated superior in such comparisons. Though Rebecca and I remained intimate, my advances were frequently received with words such as, Again, and don't you ever get enough? If it hadn't been for our children and Rebecca's numerous wonderful qualities, I might have left her long ago. However, she remained loyal. A good mother who enjoyed cooking kept herself in shape, and we worked well together to keep the house clean and the garden lovely. She would still have been my perfect wife if she hadn't started complaining about me and making all of these negative comments. Of course, I was foolish for allowing all of her complaints without voicing my own, which compounded our problems, particularly one evening after our children had gone to bed. Rebecca exclaimed, I wish you were more like my colleague. If you're so taken with such dishonest behavior, why not file for divorce and be free to act as recklessly as you want? But as long as we're married, I will not tolerate infidelity. Forget about betraying me without my knowledge and know that I will expose him. Even if you behave carelessly, your actions will have serious consequences. Rebecca started shrieking wildly. You utter lowlife! What have you just said to me? How dare you insult me? You will undoubtedly come to regret it. Isn't it fair if your clients had to pay? I reacted before she could counter with a nasty response. Children who were terrified and in tears approached us, and I did everything I could to calm them down. After her explosion, weeks passed. The first weekend, she took our children to see her parents. The following weekend, Natalie and Alexander came to visit us. Rebecca played the role of the loving wife and was nice with me until our visitors left on Sunday morning as we bid them farewell. She said, Do not fool yourself into expecting any kindness from me. The problem worsened on Thursday when one of Rebecca's female co-workers approached me at work. After a brief introduction, she went right to the point, stating, We have a new very attractive guy here at work. And three of us female colleagues, including your wife, myself, and another single woman, have competed for his attention. Despite our demands for your wife to withdraw from this competition because she is married to a nice man, she ignored our advice. Now she's bragging about winning our contest and intends to meet him at a motel after lunch tomorrow. I thanked her and persuaded her to keep our chat private so that I could address the issue at home after work. Observing Rebecca, I saw she was particularly cheery recalling instructions from a sergeant in my military service who praised the Apache warrior's tactics of surprise attacks and quick withdrawals. Despite my lack of experience in hand-to-hand -hand combat, I understood I had to use a similar tactic. And, given Rebecca's boasts about her lover's martial arts abilities, the element of surprise was essential. Because pepper spray was prohibited and unavailable, I chose a simple alternative, a little plastic bottle filled with hair, shampoo, and water. This homemade weapon proved effective when I tested it on myself, causing substantial discomfort. 
The sergeant had frequently discussed the effectiveness of secretly launching arrows with barbends from a well-hidden position in generating dread among men during the Arizona frontier wars. Although I couldn't use a bow and arrows to defeat Rebecca's boyfriend, I was inspired to modify the notion with items from my workshop. To make a barbed end, I modified a soldier's dart by sewing three one-seam long pieces of sewing needles at angles around the tip. I hoped it would be difficult to withdraw from a soft body part without medical assistance, but I had no intention or interest in trying this weapon on myself. After some thought, I designed a simple method that did not necessitate the procurement of sophisticated devices for my project. Divorce documents presented to Rebecca and her paramour, who were momentarily disoriented, would allow me to implant the barbed dart into his posterior. I was uncertain that he'd still want to be intimate with my wife, especially with the dart buried in him. Rebecca changed into an attractive dress the next morning. However, I chose to ignore it and refrain from making any remarks. We both acted like it was a usual Friday morning at work. I traded automobiles for the day with my co-worker and close buddy, Eric. We frequently used this approach when he wanted my larger Volvo Vice 70 instead of his own smaller vehicle. During the morning, I went to the courts to get divorce papers and filled out a form at my desk. After some effort, I was able to contact the main office of the aid group in Tanzania and obtain the email address of Rebecca's lover's wife. Then at noon, I went to Rebecca's workplace and noted that both her and her lover's automobiles remained in the parking lot, indicating that they had lunch at the nearby restaurant before traveling to a motel. So I grabbed a couple of hot dogs and waited for them in the motel. As you are aware, the lovers arrived at the motel, and my plan unfolded just as I had predicted, validating that my time in the army was not wasted, for which I was grateful. At 3.30... My home phone rang with the same woman who had notified me of Rebecca's motel visit the day before, asking whether I had gone to the motel and if everything had gone as planned. I thanked her for phoning and confirmed my appointment, but mentioned that Rebecca's colleagues were not delighted to see me. I tried to cheer up Rebecca by handing her divorce papers, but it didn't work. The man threatened violence, leading me to protect myself, resulting in an injury to his behind. I believed Rebecca had to accompany him to the hospital, it wasn't a romantic experience, at least by my standards. I affirmed the accuracy of my narrative, emphasizing that I had no incentive to lie my wife, who had yet to return. I suggested that the caller verify the story by calling her directly. Though I couldn't guarantee for the accuracy of her narrative, the caller, whose name remained unknown, expressed thanks and asked for Rebecca's mobile phone number, which I offered in the hopes that their ensuing chat would be informative. After that, I emailed the man's spouse in Africa to go over the entire situation. Rebecca arrived home at four, visibly agitated. She confronted me and insisted on an immediate discussion. I made no complaints, noting that she and her partner had fulfilled their wish. But it was ridiculous to expect me to meekly accept the insult they intended. I made it plain that I was willing to defend my dignity, even if my acts caused no harm to her. I had caused him serious agony, needing an emergency hospital visit, for which she promised me I would be held responsible. I informed her that we are full-grown adults with two children splitting the expense of what you and that nasty individual did. You cannot believe that the terrible nurse in Africa is content. After she received my email with information about you and her marriage, now she is aware of the filthy, disloyal scumbag she married and trusted. She yelled, Did you actually perform such a heinous deed against his innocent wife? Even threatening me with divorce was a terrible thing to do. I have not threatened you with anything. Simply sign the divorce papers, and you will be granted equitable conditions to become an independent woman in six months. Refusing to sign and consulting a lawyer will be costly for you. And in the end, you'll be faced with the same circumstances, I told her. She burst into tears as she realized I was serious. My God, are you really serious? Please listen to me. I have done nothing wrong. Yes, you did by joining your idiotic mother's crusade against me for no legitimate cause, just because I don't have a prestigious surname. You let her persuade you to relentlessly torment me. You've fallen for a colleague whom you regard as superior to me in every aspect, as you've always claimed. Then I discovered you were competing with two unmarried colleagues for a date with this alleged genuine man. 
When you won this crazy competition, you left work early today to travel to a motel and collect your prize. This meant betraying me by being unfaithful to a married man. You are aware of my views on infidelity, so the ramifications should be obvious. She kept crying. I have never been unfaithful to you, not today or the day before, and it is a certainty, and you are the only man I adore. Have you forgotten that we have two children? How about them? Our children are the only reason I haven't expelled your grumbling self long ago. Every day, I hear about all of my flaws according to your mother and your own perception of how insignificant I am in comparison to that helpless scoundrel of a real man you dated at the motel and appear to adore, humiliated by your attempt to cheat, and tired of all the other nonsense you constantly spew at me. Eventually, she recognized it was over, and we began talking about the divorce. Rebecca signed the forms after I agreed that we would both stay in our home for six months and not see anyone else until the divorce was finalized, six weeks after I took steps to stop Rebecca's infidelity attempt. Strange occurrences have occurred, resulting in what remains of my marriage. I found a good wife, an excellent wife indeed. Rebecca has evolved into a completely new person who has clearly forgotten how unimportant I was just a few weeks ago. Rebecca and I are polite to one another and do a lot more together today than we did in the months before our problems were revealed. Of course, we are no longer sharing a bed or a bedroom. Frankly, I don't miss the pity-driven brief encounter she gave me in the months preceding her effort to deceive. It is ludicrous, but I have to trust her when she says she never had sex with her true man. The date at the motel was supposed to kick off their romantic story with some private moments. The genuine man's wife requested that he travel to Tanzania to serve at an aid camp until her contract expired. He went there to save his marriage, and his wife emailed me to say he's doing well and that she's forgiven him. She even begged me to forgive Rebecca, but I'm not sure what to do because we still have at least 20 weeks until our divorce is finalized. Nonetheless, it will be interesting to see if Rebecca is sincere in her good wife efforts and how long she can sustain them. It may help if a certain dragon remains concealed in the depths of Loch Ness, Lake Champlain, or just in her cave. Here is the next story. My name is Ron, and Lily and I have been happily married for 15 years. Our family offered me enormous delight, and I appreciated my wife's affection for me. Our relationship evolved over time, and we now have two adorable daughters. We both had solid, prosperous careers. Lily worked as a translator at a film studio, and I was a security guard for a company. My love for my wife was immense, and I felt certain of her eternal dedication to me. We were in fantastic health, and we lived in a lovely home in a nice area. Our lives were filled with bliss, and it appeared that nothing could be better. Following the birth of our second baby, Lily battled to drop the weight she had gained. Nonetheless, her beautiful blue eyes remained appealing, despite her decision not to use contact lenses due to the discomfort they caused while reading or working with papers. Her spectacles' thick lenses highlighted the appeal of her eyes, making them even more seductive. Naturally, my feelings for her remained intact. I was confident that she truly loved me because our deep link was so clear. Our family was happy because we had two lovely daughters, and financial security was never an issue. My life had been full with joy until that awful moment. After 15 years of marriage, a terrible incident occurred that jeopardized the harmony and completeness of our world. In recent years, Lily has developed a habit of attending parties with her female colleagues. They visited a variety of pubs, switching between their favorites. On Fridays, they met at these locations after work. Lily frequently assured me that it was only an opportunity to converse and relax. Naturally, I didn't object that she spent time in such places, after all, I always got home at 4.30 p.m. and took care of our girls when Lily was out with her friends. I cooked dinner for our girls and gladly assisted them with their homework. I thoroughly enjoyed carrying out these responsibilities. Lily normally returned home about 8 p.m. after her walks, allowing us to spend the weekend with the entire welcoming family. We enjoyed spending time together, which brought us all immense pleasure. And yes, we did have dinner with our daughters on Saturday evenings. However, in recent months, something had changed. Lily started arriving home later as usual. She spent the nights with her buddies. Instead of arriving home about eight, she'd arrive closer to eleven, and I could tell she'd had a few drinks. 
Despite my words, I did not express my concerns. After all, she remained the same kind and dedicated wife she had always been. Every time she came back from a stroll, her face lit up with a familiar smile, making me want to embrace her tight. I recognized that going out with friends helped Lily unwind and escape the stresses of a hectic work week. I comforted myself that her interactions with the co-workers she spent time with were innocent and only for fun. Even if she began arriving home later than usual, I didn't see any need to worry. But a few weeks ago, on a Monday morning, I received an email from an anonymous sender who identified himself as a friend. I initially intended to delete the letter without reading it, but after some thought, I decided to spend the time familiarizing myself with its contents. The letter I received looked like this. I happened to be at the Black Crow last Friday evening and spotted your wife amid a crowd. She appeared to be thoroughly enjoying it. I couldn't help but observe how she danced nearly entirely with one man from her company. In case you're interested, I opted to photograph this moment with my mobile phone. Take a hard look at the photograph. If you still believe there was nothing wrong with her behavior, feel free to disregard this message. To view the photo, open the attached file from the email. I pondered why someone would send me this message if there was nothing unusual about it. Furthermore, the letter had already raised suspicions in my mind, and I was concerned about what I was going to discover. It was unpleasant to discover that Lily had danced while walking with a man she had never mentioned before. Up until now, I had assumed that Lily only dated female colleagues at gatherings. However, it was possible that she was dancing with someone who was already present at the Black Raven, but wasn't a member of their organization. Nonetheless, a knot grew in my throat, and an unpleasant feeling overcame me. Despite my inner reservations, I succumbed to my curiosity and opened the attachment. When the image came on the screen, it was noticeably off-center, as if the photographer had taken precautions not to be detected. In the backdrop, I spotted my wife's colleagues, both male and female, seated at a large table. Despite the slight blurring in the shot, I could see my wife on the right, dancing on the dance floor. She was dressed in a beige top with red flowers and green foliage, and the same brown trousers. It was the same clothing that Lily had worn the previous time she went out with her pals. As a result, I concluded that the photo I'm looking at right now was taken last Friday. That evening, she arrived home later than usual. It was 10.30 when she hugged me and stared at me carefully. Looking at the photo, I noticed her pleasant smile, but something else attracted my attention. She was standing on the dance floor, strongly hugged by a tall young man. They were tightly squeezed against one another. Lily placed her arms around his neck. To put it mildly, I was taken aback. I couldn't remember ever dancing with Lily in such an intimate environment or acting in such a way in public with another lady. The man's lower body was pressed hard against hers, and I couldn't help but think what feeling she must have felt as a result of his obvious arousal. In this situation, he must have felt desire. After all, how can one be crushed against a lady without feeling immediate desire? Despite this, Lily did not appear to be worried by what was happening. On the contrary, her lips formed a happy smile, suggesting her enthusiastic engagement. When they met eyes, I was mortified to see my wife, the mother of our two girls, clutching so tightly to a stranger and openly exhibiting her adoration in public. My disbelief was unbelievable. I knew she would never dance with me in public in that fashion. I couldn't comprehend why she would let a complete stranger interact with her in such a way. A question emerged in my thoughts. Was he truly a stranger? A sense of uncertainty started in me and it increased swiftly, despite all attempts to repress it. Various scenarios involving my wife and strange men started to play out in my head. An overwhelming feeling of nausea overcame me, prompting me to race to the bathroom, where I sadly flushed my meal down the toilet. Puzzled, I saw Lily, my beloved wife, act in a way that suggested promiscuity, as if she were having an affair. How could she betray me and our two daughters? Countless other questions flooded my mind, but only one resurfaced. Who was this man? I couldn't help but think he was her co-worker. How long had this covert relationship been going on right beneath my nose? What compelled her to go through such a horrible deceit with him? Has she betrayed me? I was resolved to uncover the truth and get actual evidence of what had transpired. 
With a renewed sense of purpose, I attempted to find out the most recent information on Lily's behavior. For the next half hour, I fled to my room's bathroom, hoping to restore my composure and mental clarity. As time passed, a tornado of feelings appeared in my mind. Disappointment, grief, and fury, all of which fed a rising desire for vengeance. I was overcome with powerful emotions that caused me to respond violently. I felt a flurry of emotions burning within me. I wanted to lash out at Lily and express my anger and fury. The next second, I wanted to hug her and implore her to end her relationship with this man. Divorce looked like a viable possibility, but after a few minutes, I was already considering forgiving her and giving her another try. Sitting on the toilet, I began to question my sanity as these violent ideas consumed me. In the end, I regained control of my emotions. I decided to avoid rash decisions and instead calmly study Lily's actions before making any final decisions. It was critical not to let my emotions influence my choices, since I wanted to thoroughly comprehend the circumstance before making a conclusion. No, I had to be patient and not tell her what I had learned. At the same time, I was determined to uncover the truth at whatever cost. I needed tangible evidence to determine whether she was cheating or simply having too much fun, but I couldn't overlook the fact that she had deceived me by omitting the complete story of her adventures with her pals. It piqued my interest because her studio was just a few blocks from my employment. Given my frequent business trips, I found it pretty easy to care for Lily. So the next day, around 11 a.m., I quietly parked my car at the far end of the parking lot at her workplace. Thanks to the tinted window glass on my business car, I was confident that I would remain hidden from curious eyes as I carefully watched the departure door, well aware that I was nearly invisible inside the car. I patiently waited till 1 p.m., but she never showed up. Throughout the week, I repeated this process. Finally, at 12.15 on Friday, I saw Lily with three other people, a woman and two guys. They'd all gotten into a clear black BMW, with Lily in the front seat close to the driver. Without thinking, I followed them surreptitiously. The firm moved through the bustling streets till it reached at a posh restaurant's parking lot. My seat is immediately across the street from the restaurant. As they entered, I noticed her happy laughter. I waited patiently in the car till their departure at 2 p.m. Lily was walking along a tall man with blonde hair— the same man she had danced with in the photograph I had of her. They exuded joy and pleasure, as evident by the gentle way she touched his hands while they talked. This exhibition enraged me. They traveled together to her job and hid inside. Except for failing to put me on notice, Lily had not committed any severe misdemeanors thus far. She frequently dined with men and women. But what bothered me the most was this company's apparent intimate socializing during lunchtime. Two couples are plainly not friends or colleagues. That bothered me the most. What was unexpected was Lily's absence from Friday's after-work party with her female colleagues. She got home at 515. As usual, he was cheerful and smiling, and he demonstrated excellent self-control. I refrained from launching a barrage of questions at her, but when we were seated in front of the TV after dinner, I couldn't resist asking her how her working day was and what she had for lunch. For a time, she seemed bewildered, but soon her answer arrived. She said she ate a tuna sandwich she made that morning before leaving to work, a liar and maybe even a cheater. Despite my mounting anger, I couldn't ignore the urge to hug her when she looked at me with her much-loved blue eyes. Even as she uttered this blatant lie, conflicting emotions were seething in me, torn between resentment and an irresistible desire to hold her to me. Naturally, a deep love for a person causes such emotions, I knew perfectly well that I had to keep calm and self-control in order not to commit an act that I would regret later. Instead of delving into her questions, I made a conscious decision to change the subject and start talking about my work days. I tried to behave the way I usually did during our weekend together. Lily didn't seem to notice the seriousness of the problem. Moreover, that evening we even exchanged intimate phrases twice, and she behaved as affectionately as ever, like a loving wife. During the holidays, we decided to take our daughters to the zoo, creating cherished memories as a single family. For a while, the events of the past week flew out of my head. Laughter and joy filled our day. During the week, I refrained from monitoring her whereabouts at lunchtime as I planned to track her down on Friday evening after work. 
When my daughters returned home at 3.15 on Friday, I was already there and was looking forward to their return. I ordered pizza for them, making sure they were happy and explained that I had some business in the office. I left. Both my daughters became quite independent, and I calmly left them alone in the house, provided that they locked the doors. I knew they would be sound asleep in their room by the time I got back. Without stopping, I got into the car and headed to Lily's place of work. Arriving there at five o'clock, watching from afar, I noticed how she drove out of the parking lot and the car headed in the opposite direction from our house, which indicated her intention to meet her friends in the pub for an evening party. It was not difficult to follow her unnoticed, since the column of six cars served as a convenient shield for my car on the way. My wife's Toyota fits seamlessly into a number of other cars that were heading to a pub, a gathering place, or a dance hall, depending on how to designate it. Ten minutes later, I saw Lily's Toyota along with six other cars drive into the parking lot adjacent to the establishment known as the Glass Shoe, which uniquely combines a bar and a restaurant, deciding to stay put. I parked the car at the opposite end of the parking lot, carefully watching what was happening from the side. After everyone entered the established mint, I got out of the car and took a leisurely walk around the neighborhood. It seemed reasonable to me to gather as much information as possible about the place where my wife went. The pub stood at some distance from other buildings, surrounded on all sides by a parking lot. Two of its walls faced the street as the pub occupied two corner space, and the other two sides were marked by a neatly trimmed cedar fence five feet high, in front of which there were parking spaces. And then I noticed a black BMW from the column, the one in which Lily went to the restaurant last Friday. Surprisingly, it was now parked right in front of the cedar hedge, standing out from the other cars parked outside the building. When I looked closer, I noticed that there are two different entrances to the building. One of them served as the entrance to the restaurant, and the other led to a bar located at the back of the building. Both the bar and the restaurant had fire doors, but they were intended strictly for emergencies. On the other side, where most of the cars were parked, there was an additional entrance. In addition, there was another entrance that also led to the bar, but Lily's company did not enter through it. Instead, they chose the entrance leading to the restaurant part of the building. Returning to the car, I took out the clothes I had prepared for this occasion. I quickly changed into a black windbreaker and put on a baseball cap to further change my appearance. I put on glasses. Finally, I put a protective prosthesis in my mouth to change my facial features a little. I put on a mouth guard similar to the one worn by boxers, knowing full well that it would make it difficult to talk and drink. But I didn't pay attention to it because it wasn't my intention to engage in conversation or drink. Looking at my reflection in the rearview mirror, I reassured myself that no one would be able to recognize me, after waiting patiently for another hour in the car. I finally entered the bar. I noticed a company with my wife who was sitting together near the dance floor, enjoying drinks and having a good time. There were six women and four men among them, including my wife. When I noticed that my wife was sitting in the vicinity of the same man with whom she had dinner the previous Friday... I was overwhelmed by a wave of sadness and disappoint meant I couldn't shake the suspicion that there was something between them. Deciding to distance myself from the situation, I chose a table in the far corner as far away from them as possible. From this point of view, I began to closely observe the unfolding events. The place where I decided to settle down was dimly lit. There were several people sitting there who, like me, drowned their sorrows. I was sure that no one would pay attention to me in this corner. Less than a few minutes later, music began to sound in the air, luring people to the dance floor. Before I could look back, I saw Lily dancing with a man who was sitting next to her. I couldn't help but see strange smiles on the faces of the three guys left at the table as they watched Lily and the man dance. It became clear to me that Lily and this man were not just acquaintances, and everyone who was nearby was watching their dance. A few hours passed and their company was reduced to Lily, another girl, and two men. In the end, both couples ended up on the dance floor and it became clear to everyone present that my wife and this man were lovers. He pulled Lily to him, placing both hands on her waist. They swayed on the dance floor with minimal movements, their bodies pressed closely together. At that moment, I saw him bend down and kiss her, whispering something in her ear. 
I watched her nod in response, and without hesitation they left the room, holding hands. Intrigued, I followed them on, noticed into the street where darkness already reigned. I watched them walk hand in hand to his car. Keeping my distance, I watched them climb into the back seat. It became clear to me why he parked the car in the last row of the parking lot near the cedar hedge. He counted on privacy and the absence of prying eyes because there were no other cars nearby. The hedge served as a barrier to his car, and he probably felt confident in this place. Curiosity seized me when I wondered what their intentions were. How far was Lily willing to go? Deciding to get to the bottom of the truth, I carefully headed to the opposite end of the parking lot. I cautiously approached the cedar hedge, hiding near its five-meter height. Moving imperceptibly, I made my way between parked cars, trying to remain unnoticed. Before I knew it, I was right next to the back of his black car. At first, I noticed the absence of people in the car. It occurred to me that they were probably in the back seat. Given the darkness surrounding me near the hedge, I was sure they wouldn't notice me from inside the car. With this in mind, I cautiously approached closer and brought my head closer to one of the rear windows, but trying to look inside was useless as the windows were heavily tinted and I could not see anything. Despite the poor visibility, I was still able to make out the muffled voices coming from inside the car. Despair grew as I considered the possible options. Should I intervene in the situation immediately and get her out of the car or wait and catch Lily red-handed for treason? The decision gave me no peace, but I had no time to come to a decision. As fate intervened in the matter... The car began to shake rhythmically, synchronizing with the music, which, as I realized, was my wife's favorite music. My anger surged uncontrollably, overpowering all caution with a quick movement. I grabbed the door handle and forcefully opened it, instantly flooding the interior of the car with the light of the lantern on the roof. To my horror, I saw that my beloved wife Lily was lying on her back, and her lover was sitting on her. They were busy with their illegal fun. Before this moment, I quietly took off my glasses and the denture that protected my true appearance. When the interior of the car was filled with light, Lily's eyes widened sharply and glared at mine with a mixture of bewilderment and understanding. In a matter of seconds, I saw her expression change from pure happiness to complete shock. After a few more moments, she spoke with difficulty. Her voice sounded hoarse and uncertain. My God, Ryan, please forgive me, she muttered. Don't make hasty decisions that you will regret later. It doesn't mean anything to me. Wait for me. I'm leaving right now, and you stay with your lover. Pushing the door hard, I closed it behind me and quickly turned around and headed for my car. When I started to drive away from the parking lot, Lily was already running after me, and there was an urgent request in her voice to wait. Less than five minutes after my arrival, Lily came into the house in a completely disheveled state. Her hair was loose and her beige skirt and white blouse were thoroughly rumpled. She came up to me with a solemn gait. Tears welled up in her eyes. My God, honey, I'm so sorry, she begged. I love you more than anything in the world. I understand perfectly well that I have hurt you. Lily, you broke our marriage vows. In all the 15 years of our life together, I have never betrayed you. If I had known that you were cheating on me behind my back, maybe I would have thought solace elsewhere, too if I knew that fidelity has no meaning in our marital obligations. I would also seek fleeting pleasures. I said roughly, Ron, please listen to me. I love you with all my heart. What I did didn't matter to me at all. I would like to turn back time and fix everything, but it's impossible. You have to believe me when I say that you are my whole world. If you look at my life in comparison with yours and our two daughters, then it doesn't matter at all. Tears were streaming down her face. Lily could hardly contain her emotions, burying her face in her palms as if looking for salvation. Eventually, her legs gave way, and she sank down on the sofa. At the same time, she continued to repeatedly express her remorse. Stop apologizing, I said sharply. What you did to our marriage cannot be forgiven. Tell me who he is and how long this betrayal has been going on since Lily was now sitting on the couch. My tension eased a little since her face was no longer looming right in front of me. When she stood in front of me, anger boiled in my veins, which prompted me to grab her by the neck and shake her. It was an unfamiliar rage that took me by surprise. His name is Nick, she confessed in a trembling voice. He's a studio colleague. This shouldn't have happened. 
You have to believe me when I tell you that I love you more than anything in the world. But then a terrible thought occurred to me. But you have to admit your deception, I replied. You've been pretending to date your girlfriends while these secret dates have been going on for two long years. Am I supposed to believe that you haven't been lying to me all this time? In a panic? She exclaimed, My God, no. All this happened for a short time. Please believe me. My love for you has only grown stronger over time. I ask your forgiveness and ask you to understand me. There was not a drop of sincere love in my actions. Tears welled up in her eyes again, and her appearance reflected the severity of the situation. She looked disheveled with swollen red eyes, begging me for forgiveness. No, you don't understand the seriousness of the situation, I replied with obvious disappointment in my voice. Think about what your colleagues who witnessed you cheating on me with another man. Think about you and me. Just imagine how they will perceive me if they see us together, whether it's on the street or in the office. This is no longer just a secret affair. It has already turned into a brazen demonstration of your infidelity. You showed everyone around you that you cheated on me. I'm sorry, but I can't bear the weight of this humiliation, and I want a divorce. I was determined to divorce her. Ron, please, I beg you, forgive me. You know I can't exist without you. Please don't say that. I'm really asking for your forgiveness. I swear to you that it will never, ever happen again. Right now, our main task is to save our marriage and protect our family. While she was talking, I got up from my seat and turned away, preparing to leave. I needed to be alone to think about our relationship. Lily, our marriage began to crumble exactly when you chose infidelity. The consequences we face today stem from this betrayal. Suddenly, a piercing scream rang through the room, followed by a plaintive crying that struck me like nothing else. When I turned to Lily, she was lying on the floor with her head buried in her hands. I saw how her back was shaking, how she was sobbing in utter despair. At that moment, conflicting emotions stirred up in me. I wanted to hug her tightly, give her comfort, but anger and a sense of betrayal would not let me rest. I no longer felt able to stay close to her, not knowing how to trust myself around her. Silently, I left our house finding shelter for the night in a hotel room. I couldn't sleep all night, and the sleep was restless and empty. Morning came, and I decided to inform my secretary that I would not come to work that day until noon. I stayed in the walls of my hotel room, reflecting on the events that had occurred. In the end, I managed to work up an appetite, and I went to the hotel restaurant where I ate a few meager pieces with a heavy heart. I headed towards my office on the way. I couldn't help but glance in the direction of my house, to my horror. There was a green Toyota at the entrance, and this unfamiliar presence increased my anxiety. I came to the conclusion that the green Toyota parked in the driveway belonged to Francis, Lily's sister and so I assured myself the thought that in addition to the unfaithful mother, my daughters could count on the support of their aunt was a little comforting, but I didn't know yet that Lily's condition had worsened. Unbeknownst to me, after I left home in the evening, Lily told her sister about what had happened on the phone. The severity of what was happening was too much for her, which led to a sudden breakdown. Now she is in the hospital trying to cope with the consequences of her emotional breakdown. It was only when I came to my office that I found out about what had happened. I got a call from Lily's sister, Francine, and we had a long conversation. According to her, Lily was in an extremely serious condition. She was constantly overcome with tears and anxiety. It was shocking that less than an hour after I left home the previous evening, my eldest daughter contacted Francine and informed her that Lily was in a delusional state and I was not at home. After their conversation, Francine quickly got to my house and saw what a serious condition her sister was in. Realizing the seriousness of the situation, she wasted no time calling an ambulance to provide emergency medical care. Francine promised that she would stay in my house, providing care and support for my two daughters during this difficult period. She strongly recommended that I visit my wife at the Santa Maria City Hospital. When I finished the conversation, I was overwhelmed, armed by a wave of shock. I was struck by the realization of how selfish and dismissive I had been the night before. The weight of my actions, or lack thereof, weighed heavily on me. Did I really not decide to leave home, abandoning my daughters and wife when they were in desperate need of support? Perhaps. But one thing was clear to me. If I had stayed with her that evening, there was an alarming possibility, however insignificant, 
that my emotions could have resulted in cruelty because of the enormous pain caused by her actions. Although she may have played a significant role in the destruction of our marriage until yesterday, I had never considered myself a person who ignores problems or avoids meeting them face to face. Is that what I did in this situation? Lily and I are faced with a huge problem, certainly an important one, but is this the only way to justify my decision to leave my family when she needed me the most? Regret and guilt overwhelmed me, intensifying the feeling of sadness when I was hiding behind the table. Tears were streaming down my face. Deep down, I wondered if I couldn't have chosen a different path. The path of forgiveness, reconciliation, and perhaps even a distant opportunity to save what was left of our relationship. Of course, the fact that we were in such a situation was the result of Lily's act. She bears full responsibility for betraying the sacred trust that should have belonged only to me. But the thought of breaking up my marriage would cause great pain to my two beloved daughters. It became clear that it was necessary to look for an alternative solution. And I thought about forgiving her. Gradually recovering from the shocking news about Lily's hospitalization, I found a new determination. Without hesitation, I got behind the wheel and rushed towards the hospital, wanting to understand the situation with doubt in my head. I went to the hospital, having neither a clear plan nor an idea of what I would say to Lily. But one thing remained firm. I was determined to understand the situation and find out the truth about her actions. The desire to understand exactly how she behaved made me move forward, ready to face the unknown with full determination. While in the hospital, I reflected on one wisdom that my mother once instilled in me. Cheaters always face their collapse, sooner or later. This thought haunts me even now when I reflect on the betrayal of my wife at the young age of twenty. Lily and I tied the knot and our happy marriage seemed like a dream come true. Our two precious daughters filled our lives with joy. And our beautiful home in a beautiful neighborhood was the epitome of comfort. There were no financial problems, and most importantly, our love with her was undeniable. But life took an unexpected turn when, shortly after our youngest daughter turned six, she got a job at a film studio located nearby. And since my wife spoke several foreign languages, she successfully got a job as a film translator at a film studio. Working as a voice translator for Lily was really amazing. The financial reward brought income, and her skills in this area were impeccable. For five years, my wife was successful until a new translator appeared tall with blonde hair and undeniable charm, quickly made him the center of attention of the studio staff. Despite the fact that many of them felt a sense of love for him, he did not seem to notice this adoration. This new translator also had different foreign languages as a result of which our paths often crossed at work, which led to the birth of friendship, which soon developed into a deep friendship. And that's where the problem arose which haunted the heart of my wife. Love, without knowing it, quietly crept into her feelings, confused in her thoughts. Before Lily could fully comprehend the situation, she already realized that she had fallen in love with him at first. He treated her no better than he treated other girls. Communication was reduced to work issues, and professional cooperation was organic. But when he started joining their bi-weekly walks, there was an imperceptible shift. Gradually, they crossed the boundaries of simple cooperation, and a deep friendship was formed between them. They trusted each other, shared the subtleties of their lives. Lily never told me what was going on with her. Soon, he was always present at parties and dinners in their women's collective. Her first mistake was that she did not tell me that men began to gather at their bachelorette parties. Over time, the connection between them grew into something deeper and on the dance floor where they endlessly swayed. They felt like one. Until one fateful evening when they were in the arms of a slow song, I didn't realize how deep their relationship was. In a dimly lit corner of the dance floor, Lily found herself in his tight embrace. Suddenly, his lips kissed hers. But it wasn't a kiss from friends or colleagues. It was a kiss that shocked her. And so the chain of events unfolded the following Friday when they went for a walk together again. He found an excuse to take her away from the pub, and as a result, they indulged in passion in his car. Then their desires only increased, and soon they were lying in the back seat like two wild creatures. The guilt she felt upon returning home was overwhelming, but she was determined that I would receive the love and affection I deserved. 
At the time, she didn't understand that I, as a husband, deserved unwavering loyalty. But given their daily interactions at work, it was becoming increasingly difficult for her to distance herself from him. In short, they became too comfortable in each other's presence. But at the same time, Lily's love for me did not decrease. I was ready to sacrifice everything. One, because my love for him remained unshakable. Lily never wanted to hurt me with her cheating, but she was very mistaken, believing that the closeness with him surpasses the bond that was between us, and this relationship lasted for months. And now she's lying in a hospital bed and telling all these details of her infidelity. I shed a lot of tears when I listened to her without interrupting. Lily swore that she would make sure that we kept our marriage, but I couldn't figure out if I could live with these memories of her cheating. But I couldn't admit it to her. After all, my beloved wife was in a bad emotional and physical condition, and I did not want to cause her even more suffering. So I went back to my hotel room and called my lawyer. I asked him to prepare all the necessary documents for the divorce. I was very worried about how our divorce would affect Lily's condition. I didn't want her to suffer, but it was inevitable. While the divorce papers were being prepared, I visited my beloved daughters and had a great time with them. I did not plan to take custody of them only for myself. It would be right for Lily and me to raise them together, of course, not living in the same house. But all my plans collapsed when my lawyer handed over the divorce papers to Lily, who was still in a hospital bed at the time. And she wasn't getting any better emotionally. On that terrible day, she got worse. She suffered a stroke when she realized that I had filed for divorce. When her doctor told me what had happened, I began to despise myself. I should have taken my time with the divorce until Lily was fully recovered. I spent three days with her holding her hand. Lily's condition was getting worse and worse, and after only two months her health condition improved, but not completely. Lily was paralyzed on the entire left side, and it was terrible for all of us. I blamed only myself for all this, but at the same time, I understood that if Lily had not started a secret affair with her colleague, all this would not have happened, no matter how much tried to persuade myself to stay in the house with Lily and our daughters. I couldn't. Realizing that every time I look at her, I will remember that scene of betrayal in the car. And so I packed up and moved into a rented apartment nearby to visit my beautiful daughters. As much as I would not like it, but Lily herself turned her happy life into chaos and suffering. Thank you for taking the time to hear today's story. If you enjoyed the article, please like and subscribe if you have not already. If you have a story to offer about your own or someone else's situation, please do not hesitate to contact me. Take care.